and it can be successful and it can be lucrative. And I remember the first day I got paid teaching in jujitsu class and I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, uh, it, it, it feels like I got paid to do something that I love. What's the most efficient pasta victory against this particular opponent? He's dropping off for the choke here. We could see the finish. It's looking tight. Tight to Delpra. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Everyday Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. I am Matt Kwan, your host. Thank you for joining me. The Everyday Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about jiu-jitsu. And today we are going to discuss mentoring an instructor or developing somebody who has aspirations of being an instructor in the field of jiu-jitsu. This might translate to other things. My previous career, culinary arts, I was um, trying to actually become a culinary instructor. I always have found that I've had a passion for instruction in things that I'm interested in, and it used to be cooking. Now it is jujitsu. So there may be things that cross over into other facets of life. If you are in a leadership role and you're looking to build leaders, hopefully you can get something out of this episode. But before we get into it, I would like to remind you to please like, share, subscribe, wherever you're listening to the show, leave comments if you can. It helps my algorithm very much. If you want to support the show, check out the links in the bottom. If you want to get some EJJP merchandise, again, the link is at the bottom and I appreciate your guys' support as per usual. Also, did you guys check out last week's episode, Donkey Guard? Have you been trying to put your training partners into Donkey Guard? Um, It's a very fun gay position that I enjoy a lot, and uh, it's even better when you submit someone or sweep someone from there, and they're kind of just looking up at the ceiling thinking, what the fuck did I do here? How did I get caught in this horrible situation? Um, If you do want to know how to escape Donkey Guard, I've developed a... uh, a solution that I find is pretty similar to escaping clothes guard. And you can check that out on my YouTube channel um, for the everyday jujitsu podcast. And when you go there, you'll find that every Saturday I release a lesson that, um, that I put on my online Academy. I do a weekly free lesson that's on there every Saturday. You'll find a new technique video. And uh, recently I put out a solution to donkey guard or an escape to donkey guard. There's both an answer to when your partner sits out with two knees to one side of your body, and there's also an answer to the classic donkey guard situation where both knees are on either side of the body. So definitely check that out, and please check out um, every Saturday if you want to see the techniques that uh, that I like to post. You know, maybe there'll be something in there good for you. All right, so let's talk about developing an instructor. Sorry, I'm just getting my notes organized here. Um, I think the first thing when it comes to identifying uh, or or building an instructor is to identify those around you who have the uh, qualities of of a potential instructor. Okay, so just, you know, I've I've opened my gym since 2015. I've had a lot of different students. Uh, To be honest, a lot of them come and go. Uh, As a gym owner, you find that a lot of students will pass through. They'll spend stints at your school and then life, you know, gets in the way. They got to move away. They go in, uh, and do another profession or their family moves. Uh, there will be some people who stick with you and there will be people who just come and go. And that's just part of being an instructor, being a gym owner. So during these times, it's important to, uh, to sort of recognize when somebody really steps up and shows those instructor qualities, because essentially what this can do is it can open up potential employing opportunities. These people can now give back to the gym, contribute to the gym. And eventually, hopefully, you know, if they're as passionate about jujitsu as me, they're going to think about making jujitsu part of their career. And I always recommend to people, uh, if if you're really passionate about jujitsu, if it's something you love to do, I think having an academy is not only possible, it's, um, it can be incredibly lucrative and fulfilling. I've always advocated for this You know, and ever since I started for I started my gym, I've always advocated for starting your own business. If you're passionate about something, if you're skillful in something and you'd love to do it, if you can find a way to make that your income, you're basically always going to have more control of your life, more freedom, and um, it'll feel like you're never at work. Okay, whenever I go on a vacation and I come back from a vacation, I'm excited to get back to work. I'm excited to go in on Mondays after my weekend, you know, and this is that you can't really put a price on this, right? As opposed to, you know, maybe you're making six figures at a job. I know a lot of people don't make six figures, but if you do and it's your business, 
and you don't really enjoy what you do or you're stuck in an office job that pays well, but it's not fulfilling. This is, you know, people will still leave the, the leave their day at work and they'll dread going back to work tomorrow. Whereas if you have something you're passionate about, something you love to do, uh, for me, it's jujitsu. If you can find that peace in your life, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I wake up every day extremely thankful for what I do, the people that I get to work with. So the first quality that, you know, good instructors need is leadership. And, um, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not a Jocko fanboy. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of things about him that I find quite cringe. However, he talks a lot about leadership and he talks about ownership and, you know, he's written books on these topics, having, um, uh, being in, being a jujitsu instru- instructor himself and also a, a, a retired Navy SEALs team leader, he has some really great insights on leadership. So I, I definitely recommend the book Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. And then he's also got the dichotomy of leadership. He goes over a lot of great stuff. And whether whatever you think about Jocko uh, as a personality, I found those books helpful and very, very um, insightful. So being a good leader, a lot of the time, you know, you're putting the group ahead of yourself. You're putting the group ahead of any one individual. Uh, You're putting the group and the mission of the group ahead of things like, um, you know, public appearance or uh, monetary gain. Like I've had to kick out students because uh, either they were too violent. A lot of time we're talking about kids here. We're not talking about adults, actually, but kids. I've had I've had to kick out a couple of kids because they've been dangerous for the group overall. And I've also had to kick up, kick out a couple of parents just because they've been toxic to the training environment. And being a leader requires you to make these difficult choices. Okay. And you know, your, your instructors who maybe you have, uh, you know, an up and coming, uh, blue belt or purple belt who's starting to step into that light where, hey, I'm, I'm, I want to be a leader. I want to help you teach. They're probably not going to have to make these difficult decisions when there's drama or it, difficult situations going on in the gym. A lot of time it's going to fall on you as the gym owner, as the, you know, the senior ranked uh, black belt or whatever you are, you're going to be the one who has to go and have those difficult conversations. So being able to do that and to talk to people when those difficult conversations are things that most people would rather avoid. I think that that's very, very important. Just for me, I, um, I'm, you know, <laughs> anyone who follows me online knows that I, I, I say a lot of stupid shit and I wear my heart on my sleeve. But one thing I'm not afraid of is to have difficult conversations because it is part of the job, especially when you're the leader. So being able to do that and putting your team first ahead of everything is extremely important. Not just the team, but the mission of the team. And usually the mission of most gyms, I would say, is to, you know, have good jujitsu, provide an environment where everyone can learn and be safe and and have fun. OK, but there are other missions where, um, you know, an instructor might prioritize things like money <clears throat> or uh, see how much revenue they can generate. And personally, for me, I would recommend against this. You can make a lot of money like that, but you are going to attract different people and your gym is going to have a different culture. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, Also, um, taking ownership, like I said. So if there's a situation and uh, let's say it didn't even happen on your watch, maybe one of your instructors was running a class, uh, you still have to be the one who takes ownership of that. I'll give you an example. The other week, one of my students came in with ringworm and uh, it wasn't my class. I have a a couple of people who teach, teach classes. It was not during my class. And then it, it turns out that this guy, his ringworm went unchecked and he trained through the class with the ringworm. And it, for those of you who don't know, uh, you should know. Everyone who listens to the show does jujitsu, I'm sure. So you know what ringworm is, but that's an incredibly contagious um, uh, fungal infection. And just by touching someone with it, you can spread it. So to train a whole class, you're getting sweaty and you're moving around the room, training with different people. This is an issue, right? It it could cause a potential outbreak. And last year I did go through an outbreak. A couple of gyms in the area did um, during the summertime. And this is like uh, a nightmare for every gym owner. You can lose members from this. Members can take months off because they don't want to be around when there's an outbreak. And uh, Ultimately, it ruins the culture of the gym, uh, even though it is temporary and it's usually not deadly. It can ruin the culture of a gym. It can force certain students to sit out and it can cause you um, money. Uh, it can take away from your income. So we want to avoid things like that. Now, this happened not at one of my classes. And it happened in one of my instructor's classes and it went under the radar. Then I had people coming in complaining to me about it. And I could have chosen to say, hey, that wasn't my class. Like, not my not my problem. But instead I said, hey, you know what, that is, uh, I really apologize for that. I can understand your concern. 
Um, here are the steps I'm going to implement to make sure that that doesn't happen again. I spoke to the instructor and I just said, hey, it's not your fault. Uh, it's easy to let these things go unnoticed, but moving forward, let's do some skin checks just for the next little bit. Let's make sure that everyone is on, on track with that. Let's make sure everyone knows what ringworm looks like, staff looks like. Uh, I'm going to put up some posters pretty soon. So you, I'm, I'm showing the student that I'm taking ownership of it and that I'm trying to take measures that will prevent it in the future. And I'm not placing the blame on my instructor. I'm placing the blame on myself be, uh, even though I wasn't there. And this is like an example of, I guess what Jocko would call extreme ownership. So if you have, I always tell, um, some of my up and coming kids, uh, I, I, I try to develop a, an environment that really enforces, Hey, being an instructor is cool. Learning is cool. Um, you know, being a coach is cool and being a mentor is cool. We should all try to try, uh, we should all try to strive for this culture here. And even kids as young as like eight, nine, 10, now they start to come to me and say, hey, can I help out with the little kids class? I like I like helping out. I like coaching. So you're basically getting free labor, uh, which is super awesome uh, as an instructor when you're in a class full of like 20 or 30 kids and you need more eyes on the room. This is um, nothing but welcomed help. And so um, it's, it's really, really great when you have people helping you out and uh, and taking ownership of things like this. So, um, that's that creating that passion, that culture of, Hey, it's cool to be an instructor. Come join us, come help us. And getting people excited about the idea of teaching jujitsu, I think is, uh, is, is a really great quality to have in the room. Uh, another thing is just recognizing when people are passionate about jujitsu, when you recognize the passion in people, that will give you an idea as to who to invest in as an instructor. Now I'm not saying invest in certain people more than others or invest in competitors more than recreational athletes. I think every student, you should invest in every student. That being said, there are going to be people who have those leadership qualities, those instructor qualities, and they have a different passion for jujitsu that personally I can relate to. And when I see that, even as in kids as young as uh, 10 uh, or 11 or 12, I want to feed that passion. I want to um, really give back to it so that they know, hey, I'm investing in you. Um, you know, I see your passion and it excites me. That is really, really important. So when I see a student like that, I will usually, I'm not going to say I give more to them, but I will th start to think about, okay, how can I provide more opportunities for this student? How can I, um, how can I sort of help them down the path of becoming an instructor like I went through and sort of shortcut some of the things that I was never given as an instructor. Cause I didn't really have an, um, I didn't really have a mentor as an instructor. I just sort of picked up my instructor abilities through develop, thinking how I was going to teach cooking. Eventually my overall goal was to teach at uh, a community college where there was a culinary program. And then that switched to jujitsu because I just fell in love with jujitsu. Anyone who knows my story knows this. So when you see that passion, um, I think that's important to understand. You see someone excited about jujitsu, someone who's constantly listening and looking at the small details and then working with other people and trying to help them. That is usually a good indicator, a good indicator of who has instructor qualities. Someone who's consistent. So, you know, if someone shows up twice a week, I'm probably not going to expect them to take an instructor or leadership role. But if you have someone who gets as many classes as they possibly can, and then sometimes I'll even have kids say, hey, I had to miss class last week. I really hated missing it. I'm sorry. You know, they come and apologize to me even, even though they don't owe me any apologies, but they're, they, they can't stand not training. That is, an, again, another indication of, okay, this person loves jujitsu. This reminds me of me when I started with jujitsu. You can clearly see they have the bug and they just can't get enough jujitsu. These are the people who I will say, okay, hey, uh, if you bring me a hard drive, I'll give you a couple of instructionals to watch. You can study off the mats. And usually they're floored with this idea. They love the idea of studying off of the mats as well. Again, uh, seeing that consistency and that passion, very, very important when it comes time to you for you to expand your team of instructors. Um, and also just the Kaizen mindset. We talked about like developing a culture of Kaizen where we're always trying to improve our systems. We're always trying to think outside the box and think of ways that we can do things differently. It doesn't matter if it's uh, gym operations, like the systems that you have in place to run your gym, or if it's the physical systems that you use on the mats, right? Or if it's act the actual jujitsu, there should always be new ways of thinking. And uh, I would also recommend, you know, if you're an instructor, you should definitely 
not get offended when people question the way you do things because the reason they're questioning why you would do something is because they're genuinely genuinely curious and they want to know if there's a better way. And if you think, hey, you know what? I've got all the best ways. Uh, I'm the black belt and you are the you know yellow belt kid. They're asking because they're curious and they're interested and because maybe they've thought of something that you haven't. Um, and, and for you being the senior instructor, you should not just shut that down. I mean, I know a lot of people who would do that, but if you do that, you could potentially shut down suggestions that could lead to better systems, even if it's coming from a kid. So having that culture where like, okay, guys, I want you to question me because if I can't justify the, the reason why I'm doing certain things, then uh, how good are my systems? You know what I mean? How effective am I if I get offended when somebody questions uh, the way that I run my gym? So having Kaizen mindset, always thinking of different ways, always thinking of upgrading your systems and doing things better and just being on a constant trajectory of improvement is something that's not just great for instructors, but it's great for everybody. It, it's it's helpful for everybody. That is, um, uh, that's kind of how I try to live my life when it comes to well, really anything, but especially skill development. And like I said, if they're passionate, if they're obsessive about uh, obsessive about jujitsu, that will show me, hey, let's invest in this person because in a couple of years, this kid could help me run classes. This kid, uh, you know, in 10 years might want to start teaching an adult class um, and eventually make jujitsu their career. And that's exciting. Okay, let's talk about like culture in the gym. How can we develop a gym culture that will be ideal for uh, developing a mentor? Okay, and really when I talk about developing a mentor, I look at my success as a gym owner is uh, obviously financial gain is good. Some people measure their business success with how much money they can bring in. And yes, that is a good metric. But for me, it's not just creating good competitors, not just creating competent grapplers or developing money, but can I create a student who is not only competent on the mats um, and, you know, plays pl uh, plays towards the, the mission of the gym and everything like that, but somebody who has the ability to develop an instructor. So once I have completed all those things and I can develop students who are excellent teachers and they can mentor somebody to become an excellent teacher, that's when I know that I've kind of, that's my measure of success. That's when I can see as a gym owner that, okay, when I'm too old to do this anymore and, you know, when I die one day, that jujitsu will be better in my area, Vancouver. It'll be better in Vancouver than when I left. That's kind of always, that's always been my measure of success as an instructor. Can I develop mentors who can develop mentors? Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, me becoming an instructor, I remember I was a purple belt and I just, I really started, I loved the idea of helping people around the room. I was moving around. People were asking me, Hey Matt, like, how do you like to do this? I'm like, well, I like to do this, blah, blah, blah. Sharing whatever knowledge I knew. I probably knew looking back, I probably knew nothing, honestly, uh, even at the purple belt level. And, uh, I remember my, my instructor took notice of it and he's like, Hey, you know, a lot of people are asking you to help them. That's great. Would you like to teach a class or whatever? And then before you know it, I was getting uh, paid money to teach a class. I'm like, fuck, I, I can make money doing jujitsu. This is the coolest thing ever for all the faults that I talk about from that first instructor. We did have a falling out. Um, he did give me that opportunity. And we did have a falling out because he eventually took the opportunity away, uh, because I was cross training at another gym. But uh, aside from that, he gave me that opportunity. He saw that I was enjoying it and he was the one who kind of allowed me to see, Hey, you can make money off of jujitsu. And, um, you know, uh, I'm glad things went down the way that they were, but that was where I saw, Hey, teaching jujitsu can be a career and it can be successful and it can be lucrative. And I remember the first day I got paid teaching a jujitsu class and I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, uh, it, it, it feels like I got paid to do something that I love. Why don't I pursue this, this fulfilling feeling and try and make something I love my income. And that's kind of where it all blossomed from. I think developing a culture for, uh, mentors is sort of showing them that, Hey, there is ways you can make, make, you can make money on this, that jujitsu 
is uh, a lot of people get into jiu-jitsu and they think, okay, like I want to get a sponsorship uh, and that way I'll get money as an athlete or I want to win worlds so that I can get paid and, and all this stuff. And the, the truth is, is you could win worlds and you could have sponsors and still be dead broke. Okay, there's a lot of different ways in jujitsu that we can monetize the industry. And I'm going to talk about uh, some ideas, how I like to do it. Uh, and everyone can do it a different way. You can, there's so many different ways that you can make money in this field. And it's all, there's also so many ways that you can uh, be dead broke <laughs> in doing jujitsu. And I'll just say this from the outsider, the, the, um, the person who doesn't train, who knows what jujitsu is, they probably think, oh, if you win worlds, like you, you get paid like a professional athlete, right? And no, you don't. The, the truth is, is nobody in jujitsu really gets paid from just competing the way uh, any major sports player would get paid in NBA or NFL or NHL. The money just isn't there. It's just not that type of uh, it's not, it's just not that type of business model. It's the sport hasn't gotten that big, unfortunately. So those people think, yeah, well, if you become a professional jujitsu fighter, you get paid, right? And the truth is no, you have to find ways to do it yourself and to develop a room where there's a culture where you can give people the tools and the avenues to make money and the, and you can keep them passionate about it. This is the kind of culture I think eventually leads to these people making money off of jujitsu. I think it's important to keep things fun because if your gym is not fun, I've talked about this before. If your gym is not fun to train at, people don't want to train there. And, you know, you could have the most serious high level gym ever. It's not going to be very lucrative if the average Joe has no place to fit in. OK, and that's why I've advocated before on the show, develop a fundamentals class or a foundations class, have a place for these recreational athletes to go. And when people are training in your class, make sure they know that you are excited to see them. Make sure they know that you're just happy that they fucking showed up because, uh, that's the worst as a gym owner is when people aren't showing up to your classes. And believe me, I've been there before and it will happen to every gym owner. And you have to ask yourself, why aren't people showing up? How can I make this more enjoyable for people? You know, how can I develop an environment where people are not afraid to be themselves? They're not afraid to laugh and, uh, you know, even kick the piss out of each other because really that's how, um, that's how friends like to interact with each other. And when I have people that come to the gym, I know some days we'll have like just such a good class. And then after class, everyone goes home and I'm mopping the mats. And I just think to myself, I'm like, this is the best fucking job ever. I, I come and I leave feeling so good and so fulfilled and feeling like I actually did something of importance and I enriched someone's life. For me, there's really nothing cooler than that. And you get paid. So Man, that, that's a, that's kind of, I think what we could all strive for. Um, okay. Invest in your business. So when it comes to building a culture for instructors, show your instructors and your customers that you value this place and that you're going to put back, uh, you're going to invest money into it to improve it, improve the experience. It could be through equipment. It could be through, uh, events or upgrades or whatever. Um, you don't want to just be the type of business owner who'd tries to make as much money as they can without giving back, uh, you know, giving back as minimal as they can. Instead, especially if you're starting a gym, you're going to have to invest for the first five to 10 years and be willing to not make a lot of money for the first five to 10 years. And then things start to really steamroll. You know, once you've made all of the upgrades and you've developed your space as much as you possibly can. And then, and then the people come and they really see like, Hey, like the, you know, this guy cares a lot and he's, he, Oh, we got like a assault bike now. Oh, we got weights now. We got, uh, Oh, he just upgraded the bathroom now. Like th this stuff does go noticed by the customers, but the customers will especially notice if you didn't, if you never put money into your business, right? If they go in and I have been to gyms like this where it's a shitty space, and then you go back five, 10 years later and it's, it hasn't changed at all. And, and there, there's clear, obvious upgrades that could happen around the gym and they still haven't been done. This is like, it just shows that either the business isn't successful enough to put money back into where it should go, or it shows that the leader, the instructor doesn't find the value in putting, uh, in, in investing back into the gym. All right. We've already talked about, uh, passion and excitement, right? This, this having the Kaizen mindset 
the the mindset of making jujitsu exciting and making learning exciting uh, that is incredibly important to a gym culture in my opinion you know i have students from blue belt all the way to black belt who are constantly studying their own things and again we kind of collaborate on our instructionals and you know i don't care who you are i find instructionals in, in, extremely valuable if you have a gym where everybody on different levels is trying to watch new instructionals and then they all collaborate you're never going to be able to watch everything. That's just part of it. But everyone can contribute and watch and have takeaways from uh, the information they they take in and share it. And when you have that gym culture where everyone's excited to share information and knowledge, that's where some some real grap- rapid growth can happen. And it just it keeps fulfilling itself as a cycle where it's perpetual, where everybody gets excited about sharing knowledge. So that Kaizen mindset, making it fun to learn, always sharing different things. This is how fast the sport of jiu-jitsu moves. And so you can get your students to help you follow along with this edge, uh, with this evolution of the sport. Also to develop this culture is invest in your people. I said earlier, it doesn't matter if they're recreational or if they're you know, one of your potential up and coming students or one of the, one of your up and coming competitors, everybody to some degree I believe deserves uh, some of your time, okay, and deserves your attention. And this is really, this goes a long way when it comes to student retention. If you ignore your students and you don't really care about their development, you know, they're going to notice that. Oh, the instructor never rolls with me. Uh, the instructor never, you know, asks me how I'm uh, how I'm doing, or even I'm bad for this. Sometimes the instructor didn't remember my name. It's amazing how much simple things like that, how far they will go. And when you have a, a room full of strong competitors, but you still develop time to go and work with the most recreational of white belts, they notice that shit. And the most important thing that you can invest in your students in as an instructor is time. So make sure that you carve out that little bit of time for everybody. And it's difficult as a gym owner. It's really fucking difficult. I'm, I'm here to tell you, but um, it, it's necessary. It's very, very important. All right, last thing I'll say is, provide resources for growth. So we t- I talked about sharing instructionals and things like that. Hey, did you see this DVD or did you see this video that uh, Jonathan Thomas just put out and just share it with people and see what sticks because not everyone can sit in front of a, not everyone can sit in a screen in front of a screen and learn for, you know, an hour like I can. But if you have these little tidbits of knowledge here and there and you, you sort of, you make those resources available to people, that's uh, uh that is really really good as an instructor for me one of the things that i did that was um i i'd like to think is game changing for my students is i developed the online academy and um, the on guard online academy is for my students primarily it is not uh i do sell it to other people as an online subscription but it was mostly for my students who would maybe not be able to make it to class a couple days a week and they still wanted to know what we worked on this is a database that i use to put my content on uh, on this platform so that they can just log in and say, hey, I wasn't there on Monday and Wednesday. What did we work on? And I can show it. And then I can give other resources on the online academy. So I have things like, uh, you know, the expectations of for kids at each belt level. Uh, there's written and audio lectures. There's uh, narrated live sparring. There's tons of shit on there. And I just wanted to make sure that I provide the best possible experience and the most value for my students. Because when you come to my gym, if you sign up as a member, you get this for free. This is not an extra charge. And um, yeah, that's just added value that I try to give to my students. I don't really make extra money off of it, but it is worth the investment in my time that it takes to build that content. All right, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about like skills or even traits that an instructor must have. And this is you know, somebody who is thinking about teaching classes, this is somebody who is potentially looking to work and build with young students eventually and build their own instructors and, um, you know, have their own students. So it could be somebody who's just teaching a class or it could be somebody who is looking one day to build a gym of their own. Good practical and theoretical knowledge of jujitsu. So obviously you can't have somebody who's an instructor who sucks. That's just uh, it, it doesn't look good on your part, but understand that sucking at uh, competition and being able to teach and 
give knowledge to somebody is not the same thing. You could have somebody who's not very successful in competition, but very, very good instructor, someone who knows their stuff and, and they have an ability to present that information and upload that information into people. And, and they have just a knack for working with people and helping them through the learning process. It's a completely different skill from going out and being able to compete. And so I'm not saying an instructor must be a good competitor, must be a good fighter, must be a good teacher, but they definitely need to know their stuff and they need to be able to perform well, I would say, uh, on the mats. Okay. Again, they need to have extreme ownership. You know, they don't pass the blame to anyone when, when things go wrong, they're willing to say, Hey, you know what? This was my mistake. I fucked up and this is how I'm going to fix it. And then they go and they, they, you know, they have those difficult conversations with people to kind of smooth things over. That's very, very important. Honestly, a lot of people don't want to do this. A lot of people want to just blame someone else and ignore problems and not have difficult conversations. And you can't have that if you're an instructor. They must be approachable and friendly. If you're not friendly, if you're not approachable, nobody's going to want to train with you. Um, you know, everyone's going to think you're a dick. It's kind of like if you're that person in the gym who uh, drives their elbow into people's cheek or in, drives their elbow into someone's neck from the top or does the uh, roadhouse choke, as Rob Bernanke calls it. Uh, you're probably not going to be very liked. And, um, you know, there, there, it doesn't take a lot of effort to be friendly or to be approachable. And, you know, if somebody comes up and says, hey, Matt, I got a question about this. You know, I remember being in, uh, when I first started and one of my instructors said, I remember my instructor used to say, oh, that's what privates are for. Right. I always remember that. Just imagine uh, a student came to you as an they were you were their instructor and they have one question for you and your response is to, hey, book a private with me. On one hand, yes, your time is worth money. That's fair. But on another hand, you know, you could spend five minutes showing that person something and they'll remember that forever. Hey, you know, that's an, that's an investment, right? It really doesn't take very much time. Somebody comes to me and says, hey, I got a question about uh, this system or, you know, coyote guard, whatever. I notice you do this a lot. I have a question for you. You know, you that is an opportunity to uh, invest and to make an impression on them. And I, I love those opportunities, even if it costs me time. It's worth it because, again, for student retention and just to build that culture of, hey, I helped you. Therefore, when you are a higher ranked student and someone asks you for help, you're not going to say, oh, go ask the teacher or, hey, book a private with me. You'll be willing to give them, uh, you'll be willing to pay it forward because that time was once given to you by your instructor. Anyways, that's how I look at it. Um, <clears throat> someone who can handle stress well. So I think one of the best things I learned in the culinary industry was handling stress. It's a very stressful environment very physically taxing and mentally draining. And then when I was developing my gym, I would have to go home and, and uh, teach classes after I worked a full day in the kitchen. It was fucking hell. I'm not going to lie. So after doing that, um, I realized that, Hey, I can handle stress pretty good. I have a good threshold for stress. Even when uh, we're in the absolute juice, uh, this is a kitchen term. Anytime we're in the juice or, or or in the weeds or basically anytime we're getting fucked and, and there's more work than uh, I can comprehend at the current moment, you're super busy. I can still, you know, uh, sort of have a smile on my face and go along with it and still get the job done. The job will always get done. That's another thing you need to think about is like sometimes you'll be in a situation in cooking where it just seems like there's an undoable amount of work. And if you have that attitude, like, fuck, we're never going to get this done. This whole thing is a failure. That's the type of people you don't want on your team. You want people who will be able to just say, okay, I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to get working and I can crack jokes and smile and lift and uplift the room in those situations as well, because there is going to be time as an instructor where you have to present, uh, <laughs> you know, you have to show kids how to wrestle and that's not fucking easy, especially for kids ages five to nine. That is not easy to do because kids want to bounce off the walls, particularly boys. They want to bounce off the walls. Uh, they want to do cartwheels and, you know, uh, climb up the rope and, and, and goof around when they're supposed to be grappling. And uh, you got to keep it calm and discipline them in a way that is, you know, not too harsh. It's effective and the kids will still respect you. If you don't discipline the kids at all, they're not going to respect you and the parents aren't going to respect you either because they're looking at you like this guy's weak. He won't even tell my kid to stop uh, to stop bouncing off the walls when he's supposed to be practicing front headlocks, you know, and then what really what that comes down to is they think to themselves, well, why am I paying this guy money? I bring my kid here 
to dis, uh, to get disciplined by somebody else aside from myself. And so <clears throat> if you're the instructor and you got a bunch of kids that are just, you know, you can't gain control of the room, they sense that and they feed off of that. And then they want to test you further. Oh, can I, how, you know, my instructor never disciplines me. So I'm just going to goof around. And uh, you got to make sure that you stay on top of these situations. You got to make sure that when you're doing a, a seminar and there's 60 people in the room, you're essentially doing public speaking. But the difference is you're trying, instead of speaking to them, you got to try and get them to learn information and they have to be able to come away with, uh, by gaining something from the presentation. It's, we're trying to upload information and get it to stick to people in an effective way. And it's not easy to do this, uh, and, and develop this presentation. You got to talk to a room full of people. Either you love it or you're terrified of it, right? And so there is certainly stressful parts of the job of being an instructor, being a coach, uh, running seminars, working with kids, etc. You have to be able to work well with all students. So this means different levels, you know, from the most basic fundamental beginner to the high level competitors from kids of all ages, all skill levels, uh, you need to be able to work well with these students and sort of identify, you know, what they need as students and, um, you know, what they need as human beings to progress, to get whatever they're, whatever they're coming to you to learn jujitsu about or, or enrich their life about, you need to be able to identify that and find a way to give it to them so that they can come away leaving class thinking, Hey, I learned something or I gained something from this that means you got to wear a lot of different hats and you know, any, any successful gym owner or instructor is going to tell you, Hey, you know, you should have a kid's program. You should have, uh, some people have a ladies program. Uh, you should have f competition based training. You should have fundamentals training. You should have advanced training, etc. There's so many different types of student that you're going to work with and you kind of have to work well with all of them and figure out what they need, uh, to get their quote money's worth. Don't, uh, somebody who doesn't make excuses. We talked about extreme, extreme ownership. I don't need to talk about that. Pretty self-explanatory and the willingness to learn and to think outside the box. Again, this kind of falls in line with Kaizen mindset, you know, thinking outside the box is incredibly valuable for any business owner, because sometimes a better way to do something is a, a, an idea you would have never considered. And sometimes it takes somebody who is unlikely or even a lower rank to make a suggestion to you. The suggestion that I needed to uh, develop an online academy or an, uh, or a database where I could put my techniques on a platform for my students to watch if they miss class, that guy was a blue belt, right? And, and I, I remember getting that information and thinking, huh, that's a good idea. I should do something like that. I really could see how that would add value to, to somebody's um, membership. And I believe it really does. Okay, here are some common challenges for an up and coming instructor. Maybe you are uh, a purple belt and, you know, your coach is now starting. Hopefully you're not teaching at the blue belt level. I feel like, uh, you know, blue, I feel like blue belts can help out with kids and things like that. But like running an advanced class as a blue belt, I think that says something about the the way that a gym is ran. And I have seen that. I don't think blue belts are necessarily... Uh, ready to teach full advanced classes. I think there are exceptions. I have instructors uh, or people who have taught classes for me who I have had a blue belt teach for me before occasionally, but he is a teacher and he's very good. He's very, very passionate about jujitsu and he's, he's, uh, he's technical, he's skilled, but that's a, that's a, that's an exception in my opinion. I think usually around purple belt level is when people should actually be trusted with like a class minimum. Ideally, even brown or black belt. Not that rank really matters. I mean, it really comes down to technical ability and knowledge. But, you know, I'm just saying we don't want like our, you know, someone who got their just got their blue belt to be running classes with advanced adults. But uh, this this is for those who are, you know, purple belt, brown belt level thinking about becoming an instructor. Um, what challenges are these people going to face in this industry? First of all, making a name for yourself. So within your own gym, developing a, 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 a reputation for yourself that, hey, I am somebody that you can come to with information, I, uh, with questions. I have information. I have knowledge. And I want to become somebody who people are not afraid to approach. That's pretty easily done in your gym, but it can be difficult when it comes to developing a name 
in your community. How are you going to do that? For me, it was through competition. I basically developed a, a reputation through my uh, com competition. I would always just try and do as many competitions as I could, <clears throat> try and compete as many times as I could. And in doing so, that kind of helped me develop uh, a name or a, rep a, re a rep reputation in within the community. And then I even made more on that by trying to uh, teach more classes. And then eventually I opened my school and, you know, a couple years go by. Um, you teach seminars, things like this. People drop in your gym. They see you're a good instructor. Now people start talking about, hey, this guy's actually a really good instructor. Uh, I learned a lot when I went to his classes, etc. It can, it can it can take time to make a name for yourself. And I think it's important um, that you find what you're good at because not every instructor, like I mentioned, is a good competitor, right? Not everyone can make a name by just being a good competitor. Some people, uh, say for example, like John Danaher, who I understand is a very... Uh, it's a rare individual where he's got like pretty much no competition experience, but he can develop world champions in different sports. So if you can develop good competitors, that's also another way that you can sort of cater to your audience. Oh, this guy has incredible ability to take information and transfer it to the student and make them a high level competitor. And this could work for kids as well. It doesn't have to be, you know, John Danaher, you know, I'm developing Gordon Ryan or George St. Pierre. It could be somebody who has a really successful kids program, right? Whatever you're going to do when you're making a name for yourself, find out what you're good at and then cater to that. If you have a great uh, competition record, play to that. That is important that you market yourself as that. Um, and so, so that people know, Hey, this guy competes a lot. He does really well. We should go see this guy. Or this guy has a, uh, really, really good coaching ability, or, you know, this guy has a really good podcast or whatever, whatever it is, make sure that you find out what you're good at and market yourself as that and play to it. Um, also, I think that, uh, you know, a challenge for an, an upcoming instructor is to find out, uh, um, is to identify what you're bad at and work on that. So, you know, like I said, there's people I know who are excellent coaches, but they struggle in competition. And so, I think it would be really important if that person wants to have competitors come to them that they develop uh, good competition abilities and they can replicate those competition abilities consistently uh, in tournaments. Again, that that does not measure a good instructor, in my opinion, necessarily, but it could help you if you want to work with competitors. So always, and everyone should be doing this in jujitsu, identify what you're bad at and keep working towards those things. Another thing that instructors are going to run into is uh, imposter syndrome. So I've had this, I've had it in cooking, I've had it in uh, martial arts. It's basically where people don't, uh, they think that their successes is due to luck or that they're not actually as qualified to do something that, uh, as they might be. So for example, an instructor might g get really nervous before he's got to teach a class or a seminar and think like, do I actually know my shit? Like, am I actually good? Even though their, um, their abilities more than prove that they are qualified to do that task. And this is something that I think, a lot of people go through when they get to a high level of something, they, they question themselves. They ask themselves, am I actually legit? Like, sh am I qualified to teach? Am I qualified, you know, to, uh, to do whatever task this is. And, uh, I've already, I've talked about in, uh, imposter syndrome before on the podcast. There are a lot of ways that you can sort of mentally convince yourself that you're not an imposter. Uh, and I think a big, the, one of the biggest things you can do is separate your emotion from reality. You know, if, if you have accolades and you've won a lot of tournaments and you have a, a school with, you know, uh, hundreds of students, you, you should look at that and separate that reality from the feeling of, am I good enough? Do I actually know anything? Because um, th an interesting quote that I heard before was, if you think you have imposter syndrome, you're probably not an imposter because you're constantly questioning yourself. You're, you're constantly questioning and looking for better ways to do something. And uh, I believe that that's true. Usually people with imposter syndrome don't even, they're, they're oblivious to the idea that they might be an imposter. They actually think they're way better than they, than they actually are. So uh, if you're questioning yourself as an imposter, you're probably pretty legit and you should just always have the kinds of mindset. I'm going to learn one new thing a day. I'm always going to be on that upward trajectory of growth. Okay, uh, let's say, you know, I'm a brown belt or whatever. And I now have decided I eventually want to start my own business or my own academy. 
one of the challenges that you're going to run into is having support. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, th I think the hardest thing for anybody who's thinking about starting an academy first is finding space and finding mats, finding a way to pay off those mats. And then when all that is said and done and they've, they found a space and they have mats to roll on, they still don't have any fucking students. This is really uh, a huge hurdle that takes years sometimes for somebody to get over if they don't have any financial backing or if they don't have a lot of savings this can be a huge challenge. And it's something that I went through. What I, what, what I did was I started renting mat space from a karate gym and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, nice guys, but probably would be considered what someone call a, a Mick dojo, right? Kind of teaching striking that isn't even, uh, it's not going to be effective in a real situation kind of teaching, uh, kind of, uh, they were teaching grappling on the floor. That was Man, it wasn't it wasn't jujitsu. It wasn't effective. I'm shocked that places like this can still exist. But still, for me as an up and comer, I needed space. I needed a place where I could, uh, you know, a couple times a week I could run classes. And just finding a place like that is difficult. So I think it's important to talk to your instructor, you know, and to say to be honest with them and say, you know what, I love teaching classes here. You're a great instructor. I really like working here. But the truth is, is one day I want to have what you have. I want to have my own thing. And that's totally fine to say that. And uh, their response will tell you a lot about their value as an instructor or as a mentor. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about that in a, in a moment here. So having, having the resources and the support needed to start that own business, will your instructor who's done all the trial and error, they, ha you know, let's say they have a successful Academy. Will they share with you the, uh, trial and error process that they went through to build that successful Academy to kind of, so that you don't have to experience those, experience those shortcomings. That's really, really valuable to have someone like that. And as a mentor, I think it's important to let your students fail because it is part of the learning process for sure. But there's definitely things that I would show somebody, somebody who's starting a gym. I would say, Hey, look out for this. Hey, this system worked really well for me. This generated a lot of leads. Um, I'll just share with you guys an example. Like, uh, when I first started my gym, I, I had a system where, okay, if somebody comes in and they pay 12 months up front as a lump sum, they save this amount of money. And it was, a, it was a substantial amount of money. Otherwise, they could pay monthly, but it would be more expensive. You will find a lot of people are willing to pay the six months up front or the 12 months up front. So in the long run, you're losing money. But in the short term gain, you're gaining uh, like a large lump sum of money. As you accrue new new students, now uh, you can start to pay for rent. You can, you know, you, if, if a couple people come in and they buy year long memberships, as long as the product's good, they'll stay. If they buy year long memberships, now you have rent covered for a couple of months. So you don't have to worry about that. Right. And then more people start to come in. And then when I started to have enough students, it was about five years in, I switched the, the paying system to a, a monthly subscription and everyone pays the same price because I already could pay for the rent. So this was, this was something that, um, uh, actually really worked well for me. Another thing I did that was great was I had a deal before. Okay. You sign your kid up. If you pay the th first three months up front, I'll give you a gi. Okay. And the gi costs like 50 bucks or something like that. But the person paid the first three months up front for their kid. And now again, here's another lump sum of money that I desperately needed to pay for rent and I, I know that I can survive and for the next couple months, the, these, that one was actually very, very successful for me as, um, as someone who was looking to, to expand the kids program as quickly as possible, because I started with like one kid, you know, and now I have, uh, I would say one of the most successful kids teams in the Vancouver area. It all started from one kid, right? And, uh, you know, when you're a gym owner, um, you want people in your gym as fast as you can. And the truth is that that's going to take time. It's going to take, uh, it's going to be slow. And if you have any tricks or, uh, ways that you can accelerate that for your students who are trying to build a, a member base at their Academy, that is incredibly helpful. Um, so yeah, just helping them develop systems for running their business, you know, payment systems, uh, marketing, what worked for you, what didn't work for you. I remember I sunk thousands of dollars into marketing when I first started 
uh, into paper ads and things like this, and they never worked. Even Instagram ads, you know, uh, it never really generated any leads. People would message me and say, hey, I do marketing strategies. I live in Chicago or whatever. Um, and you're like, oh, this sounds awesome. You're going to bring me 40 leads a month. And then you pay a couple thousand dollars and you realize eh, none of these leads are any good. Like nobody comes in. I got to chase them. It's just not um, I'm not going to say don't market. I'm just going to say that anything on paper and usually ads for me were not successful. And so you could spend thousands of dollars doing stuff like this, go through that and realize it wasn't successful. Or I could just tell you as my student, Hey, this didn't work for me. I would recommend don't do that. I'll always say the best marketing that I have and have ever had. And I have a pretty successful gym is word of mouth. Be legit, teach good shit, invest in your students and the word of mouth, your reputation will grow amongst parents and students. That's what I have found consistently with the academy that I run. Okay. Um, and yeah, so another thing is, uh, the challenges of an up and coming instructor is developing income revenue. So here's, here's, um, here's a couple ways that I generate income. Obviously I have my membership base that took me years to develop. We opened in 2015. Now it's 2024. So we're talking like within 10 years, I've made a successful business, but for the first six or seven years, it, it was breaking even essentially. And then all of a sudden there was this huge growth and, uh, you know, I, everything became paid off, uh, all the mats and things like that. And, and, uh, it just exploded and now I'm making decent money, right? So there's a membership base, but also things like, uh, private lessons, group lessons, online content. Of course, I have this podcast that doesn't make me any money, but I do it because uh, it's fun. Uh, the online academy, again, it doesn't really make me a lot of money. I just do it because it is beneficial for my students, adds value to my membership. Um, there's uh, seminars, selling gear. So if you're, if you do run a gym, you should absolutely sell merchandise. You should sell gear. You should sell uh, geese and things like that. If you're not selling geese, you're definitely um, leaving revenue on the table. Even if you can't afford to buy a bunch of custom geese up front, just go to Amazon and order a bunch of like kids, white Fuji geese for, you know, 40, 50 bucks. And then say, Hey, if your kid signs up for three months, I'll give you one of these geese. You'll be shocked at how much money you can just bring in. The gee costs 50 bucks. It is totally worth it. I think to secure a three month membership, especially when you're poor as fuck at the beginning and you're opening a gym. So, um, you know, selling gear and things like that. There's, there's so many ways that you can, uh, you, you can make money in this industry and just understand that competing is probably not going to be one of the ways that you can make money. Okay. Um, how can you help someone who want, who, uh, like an instructor or somebody who wants to make jujitsu their career? Like what can you do as the mentor to help that person? Give them your time invest in them. We talked about this on and off the mats. When it's on the mats, they have questions for you. You're answering questions. When it's off the mats, you're answering questions. Um, you're sort of showing them the things that you did and what did and didn't work as a, as a business person. Share with them your systems. We've already discussed this. Create opportunities for these people to teach. So one of the biggest things uh, that's a mistake, I think, as a gym owner is feel like you need to do everything yourself. I talked about this with uh, Nick Castiglia um, and Sam from legacy martial arts consulting, they said, if you do everything in the gym, because you need to be in charge of everything, you're doing all the books, you're doing all the classes, you're doing all the cleaning, all the marketing, you know, all the maintenance, uh, you are going to be spread thin. And the truth is, is that other people can do things better than you. Okay. So if you can employ other instructors, if you can get somebody to, to teach a class who's qualified and, you know, let's say they don't have to pay a membership or something like this, they'll find that valuable and you will find that valuable because you will get more time to do other things and your students will get to see a, a different person with their perspective on jujitsu. They'll, they will give their perspective to the students. And this is really good. Plus it gives that person the ability to grow as an instructor and, um, that giving them that opportunity is huge. It really will enrich the gym and it will help you, uh, you know, do other things because you're, a pocket of time will open up. So I really encourage you to empower those people who are potential instructors, give them opportunities to teach, um, and even opportunities to compete. Maybe they can't afford, uh, to sign up for a, 
you know, maybe you have money and you have the ability to pay for their tournament registration or something like that. Little things like that can really help, uh, you know, up and coming competitors and instructors, uh, help them with their interactions with people. So <laughs> maybe they're lacking in terms of personal interactions and they're having issues you know, uh, t sharing knowledge with people or even dealing with difficult customers. These are going to be things that you can help coach them through and uh, helping people interact with other people. That's a lot of what we do as a, as a martial arts instructor when it comes to sales, retention, uh, addressing problems within the gym. I talked about the ringworm situation before. These are very, very important issues. And um, there's a lot of people who I think could probably improve when it comes to addressing these situations. And I've made my own mistakes as well. So I could share those, you know, those, those shortcomings of my own with people who are going through similar things, I think. Um, okay. Here's another thing that you can do that would really, really help somebody who is becoming a mentor or a coach and that's help them develop their presentation. So even just the way that they talk to a group of people, I've talked in about this in my episode about uh, developing, uh, I can't remember what, what number it is, developing a successful seminar. If you're able to talk to people and do it in a way that, that uh, captivates them and really captures them as a crowd, your information will stick more. And if you can, uh, if you can do this in a calm way and even make fun of yourself, the crowd will be right there along with you. One, one thing people do is they get so nervous when they're talking and, and trying to create a presentation that uh, they lose the crowd. The crowd now starts to feel embarrassed for them. This is no good. Whereas if I go up there and I was super uh, nervous and scared and then I start to make fun of myself, the crowd all of a sudden gets this huge release of laughter and, you know, it's almost like all is forgiven. Oh, okay. This guy knows he's nervous and he's willing to make fun of himself. Great. Like now they're, now they're laughing with you and they're not feeling sorry for you, right? Uh, learning how to project your voice, learning how to not talk so fast or so slow that the presentation suffers. These are all things that can be coached. And I think it's important to, you know, when it's necessary to discuss this with people. Uh, we talked about making money. So how you can help them, those earlier revenue streams that I talked about, always giving them these opportunities and just thinking outside the box. Okay, what can we do? Maybe we could do like a spring break camp. Uh, <laughs> I've always said to myself when I was going to open a gym, I would never do birthday parties. <laughs> because I think, I think, you know, I understand why gyms do it. You gotta, you gotta pay the bills, but like doing the birthday parties where it's like, oh, it's parents night out. And you know, all the kids are coming in to watch a movie and it's a hundred bucks and whatever. It's like, yeah, you can make a lot of money out of that, but like, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to have, you know, 30 kids there watching a movie or doing a birthday party. And then I got to clean up after them. It just, it's not for me, but uh, it can, it can work for sure. And if I was starving, I would do it. So not a knock on the gyms that I know that do that, but I'm just saying that's uh that's always something I said I, I, I didn't want to do. Um, support their journey, you know, uh, not even just financially. Like, uh, you know, I, my coach Rob has paid tournament registrations for me. He's paid hotel fees for me. Uh, he supported me in times when I didn't have money and I, you know, I, I, I try to pay that forward. Sometimes I'll, I'll pay for, uh, I've, I've paid for students registration fees when they couldn't afford it, things like this. I think it's uh, important to to do that and to give advice when they're going into a big competition and, and just support your students any way they can or your instructors or your competitors it's any way you can. The more you do that, you're investing in them and it's just a net positive for everyone. Um, identify the things that they can do better and don't pump their tires, right? Be honest with them. Tell them, hey, your presentation sucks. You got to portray your voice more. You are talking too slow. You're talking too fast. Hey, you're talking and the room is getting bored or you're teaching too many things. So not everybody can uh, retain everything. You know, I, I, I've been in, with instructors who are knowledgeable, but their whole presentation becomes them showing as many moves as they can. And the result is that people don't get enough live training. And then what tends to happen is people don't enjoy the class or they don't get as much as they could out of it. And the truth is you shouldn't be showing, it's not about you as the instructor showing as much as you know, it's about get, making people better. And so when you start to teach, you know, upwards of six or seven techniques over a two hour span, it's like, this is just too much. This is just too much. We should be doing some live stuff. You know, we should be doing some uh, targeted sparring or ecological type training so that the, the stuff actually sticks to the student um, sometimes it's, eh, most of the time I find as an instructor, it's not about teaching everything, you know, because the truth is not everybody can learn all of that information in one setting at least. Okay. This one is, uh, 
this one's really big and it's going to piggyback into the last topic we're going to talk about. This one is, you know, you have, imagine you've worked with a student since they were white belt or a very young age even, and you've, you've really gone above and beyond to show them everything that you know, to support them in different ways on and off the mats. And then one day they come to you and they say, you know what, Matt, it's been so awesome. I, I, uh, you are such a good instructor. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really blowing myself here. You, 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 this imaginary person, right? <clears throat> this hypothetical person. Uh, you've given me so much. You've shown me so much. You've given me lots of opportunities, but I want to start my own business. So right away you hear that and it's like, it will be a flood of different emotions f- for you as the instructor. This person is telling you they love you, that they uh, that you've done so much, you've, you've enriched their life, you've essentially taught them how to fish, as the old proverb is, and now they want to leave you. Now they want to go and start their own thing because they want what you have, right? They want something that's as awesome as what you've built. And a lot of people don't know how to handle this. Um, it's It should be a form, a form of flattery, to be honest, because you've developed a gym and uh, your, your jujitsu and the people, the, the environment you've created is so awesome. That's one of your, uh, one of your apprentices wants that in their life. They want that. And there's a lot of instructors out there who would get jealous because they feel like they no longer hold dominion over this person anymore. Hey, you're supposed to teach for me. I thought we were doing this together. This is, I've shown you so much. I've given you everything, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, but now it's time for that person to set their own path. It's now time for that person to have what you have and to try and build their own gym and have their own brand identity and do all the fun things that ever, uh, uh, that a gym owner does. And so it's understandable from the instructor's point of view why this could hurt or why this is sad or why it's painful. And so this brings me to my last topic, how to, how to not help a student that's trying to become an instructor or an entrepreneur. This is how to not help them. Um, (laughs) holding grudges against them when they leave, right? If you hold, if you hold grudges against people because they want what you have, um, it shows something about you as an instructor. It shows that it was more about you trying to control that person and use them to help you rather than give them what you have. Okay. The only reason why I could see somebody under me wanting to start their own business and their own gym, aside from their love for jujitsu is because they want what I have developed in my life. They see how much my business has done for me and how happy it makes me. And they want a little piece of them. Uh, they want a little piece of that for themselves. And now they're coming to you, you know, hopefully they'll come to you and have this conversation. Hopefully you have a relationship with this person where they can come to you and, and be transparent with you and be honest with you and say, Hey, I, I'm, I'm thinking about leaving because I want this in my life and they want your blessing. And if you don't give them your blessing, that's really unfortunate. Um, it's sad for them. And honestly, it's, it's, uh, hard to, hard to describe what that is. Point being, someone says that to me, I'm flattered by it. I'm sad by it because it, in reality, it means we will not be training together anymore. Because when two, when you open a gym, you you have to be a hundred percent invested in that gym. So I'm probably not going to be able to train with that person much anymore. Um, and that's the sad part, right? And you won't have them to help you. You won't have them to train and 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 you know get good training in together. But one thing you shouldn't do is hold a grudge against this person. You should not look at this as, oh, I, I taught you everything. You know, you uh, you owe me. You should be loyal. Things like this, right? Instead, be happy for these people. Don't be jealous of them that they want to go and do, you know, do their own thing. Be happy for them and try and wish them well as as they're going on to this journey because it's difficult for somebody who wants to leave. Sorry, I'm just uh, I'm just a little stuffed up. I swear I'm not crying. It's difficult when somebody wants to leave and they don't have the support of the person who mentored them, right? And you can't expect as a mentor that this person who's starting their own thing is going to want to use your branding. Because for me, I wanted to have my own branding. That's part of the fun of having your own business. I wanted to have my own identity. I didn't want to wear my instructor's identity or the team identity. Some people get really uptight because, you know, they're in one of the, one of the big box jujitsu schools. Um, I'm not going to name any, but you know, take your pick, uh, GB or Alliance or whatever. Nothing against those associations, but like people get out of shape because, their student wants to start their own gym and they don't want to fly the GB flag 
oh, you're a traitor. You won't fly the flag. It's like, it's like that person wants to start their own business. They want to have their own logo, their own name. They want their own identity. Um, you know, their own branding. That's totally understandable in my opinion, as a, as a gym owner and as an entrepreneur, that's part of the fun and the freedom of being an entrepreneur. Okay. So to be upset at somebody for not wanting to do that, I think is pretty fucked up. And, uh, I've seen it before many times and I would highly recommend against it. If, if you're going to do that, when your students try to move away and open up their own school, I would highly recommend not being an instructor because you're just setting yourself up for, uh, for conflict, you know, 10, 15 years down the road when your students who you're mentoring eventually want to start their own path. You will have students who want to open their own gyms. It's inevitable. Okay. And especially people are seeing, Hey, jujitsu is legit. Like you could make a sustainable like living off of having an academy. There are going to be people that are going to do that. And so I highly recommend that you're just happy for these people and you try your best to help them. Um, somebody trying to be an instructor, try not to like micromanage or, de- or uh, their development or their coaching. So there's a difference between giving your advice and your feedback and trying to help them develop and micromanaging. Okay. Um, you, you don't tell them necessarily what to teach or, or exactly how to teach. Give them the tools so they develop their own style. Okay. And if you see things that you think could be improved, there's nothing wrong with saying that. Hey, I think you could improve your presentation. Hey, when you do this, I think you should, I think this is better. But at the end of the day, it's up to them to develop what works best for them. Okay. Unless you see any huge glaring mistakes, I would say, let them organically, you know, uh, as long as they're teaching good content, let them uh, find their own teaching style and uh, you know, nurture that, uh, teaching style. Do not try and stifle it and make it your own because every coach, every competitor, every grappler is different. And it's not about making them an, a, a carbon copy of yourself. It's about them finding their own way to express jujitsu and to teach jujitsu. Like I said before, do not resent them for building their own business. I already talked about that. Um, do not give them false positives. So if somebody you know has issues keeping a room full of kids entertained and occupied, don't tell them, hey, you're doing a great job. Don't change a thing. Be like, dude, you're 10 minutes in the class. The kids stop respecting you. Uh, we need to find a way to keep them respecting you because when the kids, when one kid realizes he can get away with murder, guess what? They all start fucking feeding off of each other. And now it's, it just becomes incredibly difficult to keep the attention of the room. We cannot lose the attention of the room. We got to think of maybe we could teach in a different way. I basically for kids ages five to nine, I stopped doing explicit, explicit instruction. I would say once every two or three classes, I will show a move and it will be incredibly simple and designed in a way to keep the kids very, very, uh, engaged, uh, let's say. I think a huge mistake is trying to teach kids tons of new moves. Put them into eco games. Make do, make them do task-focused games where uh, it's competitive and they there's a chance that they can lose. And the result of them losing is they get fucked up, you know? Oh, you're in side control. Okay, find your way out. Bring your knees in front of your, your partner. Get your guard back. Go. Put them in those hard positions. You're going to find that your kids become competent grapplers a lot quicker than if you're, they're all standing on the line every day, multiple times doing, you know, practicing arm bars against person who's just arm is just sticking out like this. That shit does not work, especially with kids. So it's just circling back. Don't give your instructors false positives. And, you know, uh, when there's opportunity to grow, not giving them that feedback that they need. Hey, I'm noticing, you know, you're teaching too much and we're not doing enough live stuff, stuff like that. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Last thing, encourage people to put, uh, the jujitsu first. So if I, and, and look, you could be a gym owner who has made their brand off of having as many students as possible. There are gyms like that. Usually they're the big box, big box gyms, or usually they're the McDojos. Okay. I can have as many students as possible, right? That's my whole business model. Guess what? Your culture is not going to be, uh, you're not going to have a lot of high level guys. Probably you need to all, uh, always put the integrity of, in this case, jujitsu first. That's been my business model. Be as legit as possible. 
provide as good of a service as possible, as much value as possible, always have the best jujitsu possible. Always look for ways to do things better, whether it's systems or jujitsu, always just try to make it authentic and provide value over, um, you know, as, as, as much, as much revenue that can come in because I've seen this happen firsthand at a gym. It used to be about the jujitsu. It used to be about the music, man. Kind of, kind of like that, right? It used to be about the jujitsu and then it became all about money. And when that happened, Man, should have seen the culture in the gym change. All the high-level competitors left. They all went and started their own thing or trained somewhere else. And I was one of the last ones left there. And then I realized, like, man, this is a fucking recreational gym. Like, that's great for some people. But for me, it wasn't what I wanted. And so I'm not saying you can't put the money first. It's just you're going to get a different gym culture. If you put the jujitsu first, that's the type of gym culture I'm looking for, where everyone cares about... um, you know, how can we get, how can we be the best we can possibly be? How can we have the best jujitsu? How can we create the most value, the best environment to learn and to share and to grow and down the road, hopefully have uh, students with successful gyms uh, and successful students who go on to be successful competitors and have successful gyms. Anyways, oh, if you're still with me, thank you very much for listening to the episode. I know I've just gone on and on. It's something that I'm very passionate about, and I hope you enjoyed the chat. Um, <laughs> it was it was a, a lot of fun, and I'm very tired right now, so I'm going to go have a cup of coffee. Before I leave you guys, please, I'd like to re- remind you to like, share, subscribe to the show. If you like the content, please, you can also leave a donation on my PayPal. You can buy my kid's book, buy some merchandise in the store. All of those links are at the bottom. If you leave comments, it really helps my algorithm. If you subscribe, it really helps. All this shit helps, guys. Even if you can't donate or subscribe to the Online Academy, that's okay. All you got to do is please like, share, subscribe. Uh unless you don't like the show, in which case, you know, you probably shouldn't share it at all. (laughs) But anyways, guys, I'm out of here. I'm fucking tired. And I hope you guys have a great week of training. Remember, Everyday Jiu-Jitsu Podcast, it's everything you need to know about jiu-jitsu. And I'm your host, Matt Kwan. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.